So I think that we can get um started. So it's okay. like 6.03 um, here. And okay. we have like um, 25 um, people um, here with us. Um, so I wanted just like to give like a brief introduction of like um, who we okay. are. Um, so this is like the Westside Studio course and it's okay. an undergrad and grad uh, course at the University of Utah in city and metropolitan planning. And it's a studio course. So every uh, year the topic changes, but we are always um, trying to highlight uh, the West side um, in, in particular. Um, so we, we will be actually doing a project um, that is uh, an Earth Day event in Poplar Grove, but also this class has been doing some comparisons between East Side and West Side, um, analyzing parks and thinking about um, equity, more like broadly um, speaking. And we are working um, with the Public Lands um, Division or in the Public Lands Master Plan. And um, we had a previous class that engaged in this, and this is another class that is engaging in like window two. Um, so they have done like a stakeholder um, workshops or participated in, in some, of, some of that. Also, they have done like some demographic analysis of different um, parks, analyzing east side and west side, and also like an, an audit, um, just like doing surveys of, of parks. And now we are get, getting into a little bit more of the participation. So this like um, placemaking um, event is to think about, uh, we have like a series of events actually. So this one is like the first one and it's like just to generally think about like how to make um, our parks um, to feel like a place, right? Um, and what does that mean? Is it like signage? Is it like uh, through art, um, through bringing events like culture and arts? So any, anything goes and we would like to hear um, about that. And through this like event um, that we have invited um, James Rojas and um, James is a planner in Los Angeles and he um, started um, Placeit. So he's the founder of Placeit, which is like this technique that that you I will be doing today um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very excited of having like James um, with us but before having James introduce himself and also give like a, a presentation to like get us um, into um, thinking about um, memory and thinking about um, what are the places that, that we love and why um, we are going to like just hear a little bit uh, from Nancy Monteith and uh, she is working on the master um, public lands master plan. So Nancy, do you want to say a few words? <laughs> yeah. I forgot to unmute myself. So uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who's here tonight and I think Eva's put together uh, really relayed our whole process really well. And uh, I am with Salt Lake City and the project manager for the public lands master plan. So it's a comprehensive plan that will craft a 20 year vision for the future of our parks, trails, natural lands, urban forest and golf. And um, as Eva said, we've, we've gone through a whole series of process from um, soliciting the public, their general input, and then focus groups um, and diving a little bit deeper in conversation, and then uh, visiting sites and evaluating the state and condition of those sites. And one of the things that uh, I see is a really strong connection between the work that we've done, uh, in particular with the focus groups, we heard a lot from the community that they really wanted to see their neighborhood parks improved and they wanted them to reflect who they felt they were and what their neighborhood meant to them. And I think that it's sometimes really hard to figure out how, how to do that. So I'm excited to go through this process with you um, to, to kind of think about a way to, to get those ideas into, some kind of conversation of creating a place. And we also have, I see tonight, we have Kristen Riker, who is our director uh, of public lands and Lee Bol 
Bullwinkle, who's also here. He's our Parks Division Director. So they're also really interested in, in what we're doing and really want to see these parks become loved spaces in the city. Um, so now we have like about, I said, like 12 minutes um, to hear from, from James and this um, technique. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see if I get that. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah, and James, if you can introduce yourself, that'd okay. be great. So I'm James Rojas, and I'm a urban planner. Uh, and I do I most of my work is community engagement, but I started off as a planner 30 years ago. I went to MIT and did my research on Latino urbanism, where Latinos use public space. And that's kind of where it got me the idea about how do we understand spaces from deeper meanings. You know, so I developed this method for Latinos to get them engaged in planning because a lot of them would go to meetings and all they would do is shake their head. So it's a way, really good way to get people thinking differently about space. And, uh, you know, the whole idea is that, you know, a self-taught artist uh, draws from my love of people and cities and planning to reinvent engage public and reflect image collaboration and, and you know, equitable cities through creative actions, not words. They find that actions are a lot more powerful than words. You know, so you'll you'll see that today. So yeah, so so the whole idea is to really get so the evolution place has started with the shoebox my grandmother gave me <laughs> and a bunch of objects when I was a kid, and then I opened up an art gallery in downtown LA. At the same time, I was working with LA Metro, and we were doing, we were doing engagement to build these rail lines in the city, and we had meetings with Latinos. They wouldn't say a word; they would just nod their head yes or no. But I knew they had more ideas. So I thought, how can you get Latinos to really engage, you know, in, in really deep, meaningful ways in planning? So I started using objects, you know, because because artists would engage people with their senses. And I thought, well, how could we as planners be like artists engage people with their senses? So I, so I started doing workshops on my gallery. And since then, I've been over a thousand workshops across the U.S. and abroad, but using a different way of kind of thinking about planning. So the whole idea is to really challenge and enhance our approach to space the urban plan architects landscape with transportation, but, they, but using, using, using model building storytelling and play. This is actually working in Tijuana on design and cultural design, design, design their community center down there. We just built a model and everybody, everybody build their ideal park. And they did. We gave, the, we gave the city 10 pages of notes to build a park with. And it was great. They had a good time doing it. But, it was, but using their hands made it a lot easier you know, for them. And uh, and the whole idea is to really think about, you know, how do we design spaces that are more about relationships and less about uh, transactions? Like if you look at the Native American wayfinding, they use nature as a way to go to, as, as a way to understand wayfinding, as opposed to we use abstract symbols and words. So how do we get back to that kind of relationship with the land? I think that's what people crave, you know, is how do is, is relationships? You know, how do things connect with them on a one-on-one? -on -one? You know, not just transactional stuff we do, but but again, in the U.S., you know, we're about the we're about the transactions. We're about the highest and best use. You know, so I think that's what really makes our job hard as park planners that we have to really think about relationships in a society that really values money and highest and best use. So for here, you have the Pilgrims and their kind of policies about you know being an exclusive religious right. Then you have you know Monticello, which is actually just a factory that dictated you know it saw land as a resource, not as a relationship. So you really think about land in different ways, you kind of bring ways to thinking about land, but it's how we structure our planning efforts. So for us as Latino, you know, we're half, I'm half indigenous, half Spanish. So I have a different way of looking at land. It's kind of kind of half indigenous, half European, but kind of mixture of, you know, back and forth. So I was looking, so, I, so, this, so that's why I developed Placeit as a way to get people to really, you know, not, not look at the stuff we build, but what drives the design process? It would drive people to go to a park. You know, it's that memory of a park they had in their childhood that's gonna bring them back to that park. You know, so the whole idea is to really get people to express their intuitive knowledge about spaces and why they value them. You know, how do you how do you embrace your emotions, you know, as it, it, part of this? Because I think for a lot of planners, they take pride in knowing something but not feeling something. And for community members, it's all about emotion. You know, they like the street, don't like it. A woman will walk a certain way by herself, a different way with their husband. So it's all emotional condition that we have in our cities, but how do we capture that, those tools and also really enhance the relationship people have with others in spaces. So yeah, but the whole trick for places is using your hands. 
because so, people have a lot of different ideas about hands. Because what happens is, as kids, we're about emotions. But then, as adults, we learn how to talk, and talk becomes our barrier for creativity. So when you remove the talking part, that's why you, you go to public meetings. People say the same, people say the same things all the time because they're in that same talking mode. You want to break that. You want to bring people out of that talking mode so they can they can they can be they can, they can access their emotions and creativity and joy. That's why I use the hands spot and place it. So objects activate creativity, physical connections, and collaboration. And you know, it's like art making. People imagine, investigate, construct their, their memories and reflect on it. So you're going deep, you're going deeper here. You know, where, what are people's stories? You know, where, what are their ideas, thoughts, emotions? And how do you make those realities? You know, this, this woman talked about biking through a forest, you know, in LA, you know, she had from home to work, but she, that's the way she expressed it. You know, and then, so for folks, I always start the favorite child memory as a way to get people thinking about urban planning. But I tell people that memory is your DNA for the city planning process. You can look for that memory the rest of your life. You can try to find that memory the rest of your life. So how do we up, up, up that story, bring it into the park plan, the housing plan, the transportation plan? Because now that plan becomes yours. It's based on your memory and your story. And for a lot of people of color, these are Latinos that speak Spanish, their memory is part of the plan, you know, and how to get them engaged, you know. So for African American women, for a lot of them, it's doing hair with their elders, and that's part of their story. That's to be part of the plan. You know, but here you, then after after that, everybody explains their, their after, after building their memory for like you know five minutes, everybody explains it for for thirty seconds or a minute, and that opens up for everybody because far too often people go to meetings and they don't say a word, but just having to tell that story, you're in like Flint now, for, especially for immigrants that you know don't know who's in the room, and they get to hear they get, they get to hear those stories from, from other people, and then plus they get to tell their story where they come from, what they value. So equal equal is a playing field. And it also creates empathy where people can be empathetic towards, you know, how we plan. And, you know, that's what we need for planning. We need to be empathy. And then after that, people are ready to collaborate and build. You know, they build together. But if you tell people that in planning, there's no right or wrong answer. It's how we collaborate, who we collaborate with, and how do we get that forward. So people collaborate, and then they really they're stronger together. That's what we need to do. So to get today's goal is to really get to know each other and have fun. See, we're going to do three, three trade. You can do two workshops, I guess. And uh, so now we're going to be we're going to go in our small breakout room, so people can. Uh, I'll see you in the small breakout room. Where we're going to start. Yeah, the so that's memory. that's correct. And then um, Nancy Monteith and also James Rojas will be like going from room to room. So that that means that you guys have to come here to the main room, so I yeah. can send you to another room. Okay. And then I will be monitoring a little bit the time, just sending, um, you know, s signals. And um, then I, and the students can also like participate. So that's kind of like the idea, right? Yeah, so yeah. You, you also build. Um, they're they're, they're going you know, to all build a fairy child memory mm -hmm. in five minutes. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So I'm going to open the rooms and have fun. Okay. So we are all here, James. Okay. So uh, maybe we can have uh, three groups really quickly report back to what they heard, you know, with the, from the, you know, from, from group number one. That's a good group. Let's talk about what they, what you, what you got, what you guys built as childhood memories that were common, and what did you guys build as parks that were common. I don't think we know what group we were. Do we? I bet Claudia does. Yeah, the first group it was like um, Alta and uh, hmm. Lee. Yes, Taylor. Maybe we can hear from um, yeah, like, not the students, but maybe like people who join us as guests. Maybe in room one is Alta and Lee. So I guess you're talking about me. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> care from that, your group. So it, it's it's quite interesting, you know, being in the business, uh, maintaining parks and being in parks for as long as I have to hear different perspectives of what should be a park, you know, water, trees, a pavilion, someplace that you could go and reflect and be like a happy place. And it's always it's always interesting because Nancy and I always kid that sometimes we get tunnel visioned and we just think about the thing at, at hand and we don't really look abroad to see really 
how big we could expand. So uh, in my group, it was it was interesting listening to uh, the comments and uh, you know the childhood memories. Uh, one was about Lagoon, and uh, the other was in Japan, and and just you know it was, it was just interesting to uh, listen to those memories and uh, kind of uh, correlating and actually thinking about my own memories. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to to listen in. And Lee, what about creating, we should be thinking about creating spaces where kids are making their memories and how would that change the way we design and manage our parks? Absolutely. So true. You know, it, it's not always about, you know, cause me, I'm on the end, we're on the end. We're the ones that have to maintain it, but it's really those users that come to the park that are creating those spaces. And, and that's why we're there is, is to help build and create those memories you know, when a family comes into a park, that's that's really the the goal, the you know the thing that we ought to be looking at. And you're right, Nancy. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. So, so in 20 years, you'll be hearing memories about your parks. <laughs> yeah. Well, the whole idea is to really get people thinking about infrastructure, not as infra, not as brick and mortar, but as lived experience. Mm -hmm. Far too often, we think about infrastructure as being brick and mortar, and when you talk about it that way, people kind of disengage from it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know a lot just the park and we need, we need more task and more lights. But I think when people talk about it from memory, a little experience, then you feel how rich these spaces are really, really are and how people can uh, really appreciate them in a, in, a deep, in a deeper meaning, you know, because I think that's what people, and they, and, they, and they can also reflect on a way that these spaces can improve their lives. Yeah. So I think it's, so I think it's how you approach for, for, for any for any planning project, housing, open space, and parks, transportation, think about it as a lived experience, as an emotion, as a memory. That's what, that's what you're bringing into that space. And then how does a memory inform the infrastructure, the wayfinding, you know, the, the you know the bathroom, mm -hmm. all that other stuff. So this is a good way to get people. This is a good way to get people thinking about it. You know, in that really deeper in a deeper level. It's great. Then for group number two, we have here as guests, Maria or Katie. So someone to share. Um, yeah, what exactly should I share? Um, James, what well, was your question? Oh, okay, well, what did you hear from, you hear from these, uh, these, your group? Sorry, what was that? Sorry. Just a summary. Yeah, summary. Uh, yeah, so um, what I thought like was really interesting. So for me, like I'm not in this class, I'm majoring in psychology actually, but I'm interested in kind of switching paths for a career. And so I thought it was really interesting to hear about um, the way that like we can involve culture and how we can do that through um, like art that can like remember history and things. Um, and I think that's really important. I think that's something that I see is kind of like left out of um, parks, at least like where I'm from um, in Kentucky, you know, there's the community that I come from doesn't really, I think embrace other cultures because um, it's a small town, no one's really moving there. And so I thought it was interesting to hear about how we can create spaces that are not only more accessible, but more inclusive and actually welcoming and drawing people in, um, no matter what language you speak or no matter where you're from. And so in our group, like we talked about that and how like we can do that through art and how we can do that through, um, like they said, art walls, which I thought was like a great idea in parks, like to have walls like where you can kind of change that connotation of graffiti from something negative into something positive. Um, and also like we talked about waterways and food production and things that are really healthy and vibrant for a community. Because um, those are where you make your memories. Like we said in the first round, like when we were talking about memories, you know, not a lot of them were really indoors but they were, they were things that were outside, places that we were moving around, um, things that we remember about our environment and how it was shaped in order for us to be able to better interact with it, which I thought was really cool. 
Yeah, yeah, those are really good points. I think, uh, yeah, it's the whole idea of the child memory is to really talk about, really think about who's going to be used. What, what do we as people, as individuals, bring, bring, bring to the table in this park? You know, so it might be a dual, you know, na binational upbringing in Latin America and here, or it might be from Kentucky, or it might be from somewhere else, but you're bringing all of rich experiences to this park design and plan. So how do we tap into that? You, you know, and I think and, you know, by having more experiences, we have more options to create more inclusive spaces and more, more solutions. Because I think we can really expand, you know, our way of problem solving by having people to share your story to kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of give the, give give the respect people need to share that story, you know. Because you know, I think uh, once I did a workshop in New York City at laundromats for a group of people on a, on a park on a river, you know, in the Bronx, and everybody the, la the laundromat was from the Caribbean. They had no idea where the river was, but their idea of rivers were Caribbean rivers, even though they lived in New York City. So he has kind of a, so how do we understand people's way of thinking about spaces and parts from where they come from? That's why I think the board's really you know tap into that childhood memory to tell that story. Thank you, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and then for group room number three, we have here as guests um Soren and Christine. Is there one of you that like to report back? Soren, do you like to report back? Um, I don't know if I paid close enough attention to be able to report back for the whole group. <laughs> um, Kristen, anything you would want to contribute? Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, all the stories, the memories that were told reflected a certain sense of imagination in folks and um, exploration and independence. Um, people riding their skateboards to the park and um, skiing with their um, grandparents and just having these visualizations of uh, monsters and, and things. Um, I, I think that, you know, what I took from the memories is just the creative um, aspect that, um, you know, comes from play and, um, you know, that, that real, everything was very positive emotions that came out of, um, those memories. And, um, a few of them were with family members and, um, and, and it was just all very positive and, you know, good memories of parks. Um, James came in and asked, you know what's missing and we're all like well garbage cans and restrooms and parking places and those are just the things that are the nuts and bolts of parks but they're not what makes parks special they make parks work but they don't make parks special and so um you know i thought that was a, a really good point to make that there are um there's we just need to create spaces for people to be creative and imaginative mm -hmm. in play Yeah, because I think, you know, because people, because we all have imaginations and that's negotiable and that's free. You know, this, like, this workshop was really just doing yourself, telling a story and just sitting down for a while, but it was all pretty, very, very kind of low research intensive, but the imagination is so vast and endless and you can tap into it and people can negotiate their imaginations. You know, they, can't, mm -hmm. they, they, they don't want to negotiate money, but they can negotiate their imagination. Just to give people thinking about using our imaginations. Because it's out there, it's free, and we can just talk about it really freely. And I think the whole idea of uh, you know being positive, I think for me, you know, the reason why I haven't rebuilt is because when you build, you always build you always build a solution. You never build a problem. Nobody nobody ever nobody ever says I'm gonna build a problem. You build a solution. So I think it's a way to get people thinking, because when people talk, you know. Uh, they tend to talk about problems, they complain, and they argue. And then you kind of get this kind of negative, negative space. But when mm -hmm. you build, it's always positive. That's why I always have people build in my workshop because once you start talking, it, you, know, you know, might go, might go to a different, you know, kind of vibe. So this way, keep it up. And, and, and it's also kind of talking about what people love about a place, mm -hmm. not what you don't have. Because a lot of times, I think a lot of people say, what, what, what are you missing? And then people start 
it's a big laundry list, right? It's like Santa Claus list. But I think when people talk about what they like about it, we just want more of this. Yeah. yeah. You know what struck me was uh, almost all the experiences were intimate. I don't think I heard anyone say, you know, being in a big crowd or being at an event. And it, it was never kind of... Uh, uh, a witness to an experience. It was a personal experience and, a, and more likely an intimate with nature, with people that we care about. Yeah, and that's really important. I think people to have these intimate experiences because that's what, you know, it was interesting too is that, you know, I've been, do, I've been facilitating these workshops through Zoom for the past couple of months and people get really intimate really quickly because they're in a personal space, using their own personal objects and it's safe. <laughs> yeah. You talked about it. you could show your you could show off your house plants you could show off all your artwork whatever you have there and it becomes really and people realize that their life is about intimacy about relationships about things around you and then how do we transform how do we bring that out to the public how, and how do, how do we bring that to a park because we want to create these temporary intimate points in parks that people can mm -hmm. have and then that, that's, that's what they're going to remember people remember those intimate experiences, like all your memories mm -hmm. for just a brief second of smelling the flower or seeing water. And that's what the kid remembers for the rest of his life. You know, mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to, to have these kind of intimate discussions and really kind of, you know, and I think, I think that's what makes a, that builds that, that build a relationship and makes, makes it a lot more meaningful for people. Not people, not people felt that they've all been heard because they talk about something intimate. Mm -hmm. It was just post it notes and a dog and maps. You kind of go, you would go home kind of half fulfilled. <laughs> and then I think it's also important to get you know, all your stories because now all of us in this room are uplifted. Mm -hmm. your, your story uplifted my life and vice versa. You want to create that kind of positive vibe. People say, yeah, it's, it's like going to a good party. You know, you have a good time, everybody's happy, and everybody uplifts each, uplifts each other. And this is what this kind of like, this is where our stories do. We uplift each other. So, so this is a good way to get people involved. One thing that I wanted to share right now, um, just like coming back to this big bigger conversation, is that um, you know thinking about parks um, now for me is like whenever I look for a place to live, like that's kind of one of the things that I look for. Like right, what's where mm -hmm. park. Uh, or where's my nearest trail that I can go to? Um, and, you know, even like a dog park, like we, I don't think any of us mentioned uh, animal <laughs> dog park, but um, like, that's a, a big thing too, right? Like for communities now, like where are you purchasing your home? Like what's around that area that's walking friendly? And definitely a park is one of uh, on my list is like, where's the nearest park I can walk to like within, you know, a block or two blocks. And I think also with COVID, you see a lot of people going to parks because people realize that now your life's tightened. You know, now before, you know, you, you can't really drive anywhere. You have to kind of walk, be in a your, in your small circle. So now walking around the block becomes important. So you're looking for trees, nature, flowers, all these things that kind of bring you happiness, but it's really a smaller scale, a more intimate scale. That's really showing people a different way of living. You know, for me, I've been in Oakland for the past eight months and I haven't traveled. It's kind of like not my world, but, you know, but luckily I can walk around the block and I'm, I'm 10 minutes away from a, you know, I can go there after work and hike for, you know, half an hour and come back. But that's really a way to kind of, kind of get me charged. And I think because of COVID, people are thinking about, you know, their health and, and what, they, what they long for. You know, I know in LA, you know, once they opened up, People, people, the, the parks are overcrowded because all of a sudden childhood memory kicks in. It's in that childhood memory becomes your your happy point, your happy place. So now people go to parks and all these spaces. So I think it's important to understand, you know, how COVID is really shaping and changing the way people think about, you know, nature and in, in, in their communities. So um, I think that we have like arrived to the end of this. So thank you so much, um, James, for like your time and for like sharing with us. This has been uh, really enriching um, to all uh, students and also community members that um, join us today. And uh, Claudia actually like posted uh, 
an announcement. Um, so you can find it a little bit up the chat. I can just like put it here again. Um, but we have other placemaking workshops. So the next ones are going to be more specific. There's a link that you can sign in for these ones. One is about like cleanup and a general placemaking activity that we will have on the April, or March the 24th. And then we have um, another one that is about um, paint, paint a pavement and way, wayfinding. And uh, the students will be actually creating a mural um, on a concrete space in the Popra Grove um, Park. So they will be getting some ideas about um, that and also painting for wayfinding in the general area. Um, and also the, some of the other students um, are doing tree planting and flower planting. So you can register for those. One opportunity is online on the 24th and the other ones we will actually meet in Popra Grove to be part of, this, um, of these workshops. And then we also have like at the Earth Day event, um, which is um, in person and it's like April 24th, that's a Saturday. You can register to volunteer. So you can come and plant flowers. You can come and paint. Uh, kids are welcome. They also love painting. So um, just like make sure that you like register for that and you can come as an observer or um, again to volunteer. And we will have other community engagement activities as well as um, as food. Um, so those those are the announcements that that we have. Um, just take up a minute to just actually go to those to those links, and um, and register. And uh, Nancy, do you want to like say something? Um, you know, I think. <laughs> This is sort of my work to design places, but I feel like this experience with you guys tonight was a really transformative one and thinking about, you know, really um, kind of going back to sort of what are the feelings and what are the, what are the things to make memories and, and that I loved the sharing and this ability to connect with other people's experiences and it's um, it's nice just to change your perspective. And um, I, I think it's a great, a great um, process that would be fun to do again. Yeah. Yes. And thank yeah, you so much yeah. for all of you for being part um, of the Salt Lake City upcoming master yeah. plan of Lakeland's master plan. So, and thank you, James, for um, just like being with us and, and sharing. So we all, the students will stay here. So we will take a 10 minute break, but for all of um, you that were here visiting, um, then we hope to see you another time. Should we take a picture before we uh, Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if people want to have their cameras on, that would be great. There you go. Uh, yeah, and comb your, <laughs> comb, comb, comb your hair too, right? <laughs> Lee, right. turn on the camera. Yeah. And I, I will send you this, James. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure working with you all. I 